So welcome to this seminar from the General Optical Council, um, which will focus on our new standards for optical businesses. My name is Alistair Bridge, the GOC's Director of Strategy, and I'll be facilitating the discussion. So first of all, thank you very much for uh, attending and being involved in this uh, webinar. Um, as you probably know, it has been accredited for CET. There's one point available, but with an important caveat, you do have to stay for the whole session. Um, there is also still time to submit a question about the business standards if you haven't done that already, um, but please do so within the first 15 minutes. So moving on then um, to um, a quick slide to go through the structure of the webinar. So there are four parts. I'm gonna quickly go through the learning objectives that we have and then I will introduce our panelists. Um, we'll then go on to a presentation explaining the rationale um, for the new business standards and outlining the different areas that they cover. And then really the, the main um, part of the webinar will be a discussion uh, among our panel. We've got some hopefully really um, interesting questions to explore. And then we'll, we'll go on to a Q&A at the end. We've already had quite a few questions submitted. So hopefully that will also provide a lot of interesting food for thought. Um, so uh, the learning objectives, two of those, the first being to understand the content of the GOC's new business standards and how they apply to your role as an employee, uh, a business manager or a director. And then secondly, to understand how to apply the business standards and the preparations that might be needed to make sure that you're compliant with them. So those are the learning objectives. Um, here's a picture of me, um, Alistair Bridge. Um, so I'll be chairing the session, as I've mentioned. The remainder of the panel, we have uh, Dr. Josie Forte, member of the GOC Council, practicing optometrist and uh, a joint venture partner with Specsavers. We're also a member of the FODO board, FODO being the professional body that represents um, businesses across the optical sector. Um, second of our panelists, um, Helen Tilly, another of our um, GOC council members. Again, a practicing optometrist, now an independent prescriber as well, and the owner of a, an independent business in Wales, and formerly chair two of Optometry Wales. Finally, we have Marcus Dye, the GOC's head of standards and CET, wealth of experience of regulation, um, setting standards, has been involved throughout in developing the new business standards, and before that, um, played a leading part in developing our standards of practice for individual um, optometrists and dispensing opticians. So we will move on now um, to Marcus's presentation. Um, he's gonna talk through these next slides before we move on to the panel discussion. So over to you, Marcus. Thanks, Alistair. Um, so I just want to give you a brief background on the development of the business standards. Uh, so these are part of a wider work um, or uh, standards strategic review that we undertook at the General Optical Council. Um, you'll remember that we introduced standards of practice uh, for optometrists and dispensing opticians in 2016 alongside standards for students. And then in 2017, we produced um, some supplementary guidance on candor and consent uh, to support implementation of those standards. Um, the standards for optical businesses are the last part of um, this review uh, to make sure that we can adequately outline our expectations of optical businesses um, in the same way that we have done for uh, individual optometrists and DOs. Um, the standards will replace the previous code of conduct for business registrants that, that was in place since 2010. Um, and, it, and the new sets of standards take account of learning from recent healthcare reviews and are intended to complement the standards uh, for optometrists and DOs. Uh, but we also needed to make sure that they were fit uh, for optical businesses as well and taking account of um, the rapidly evolving um, care pathways that, that we have. Um, in particular, we were looking at uh, how the sector is evolving itself, taking account of things like the, the um, increase in uh, online businesses. Uh, we, take, we took account of increasing use of software and artificial intelligence and di digital technologies um, in the workplace. 
Um, and we took account of the fact that um, a lot of uh, business owners don't necessarily have optical backgrounds. Uh, maybe coming to this, uh, this uh, theory of regulation um, new, um, and we need to be able to make sure that we uh, are able to communicate our expectations to those people as well. So how we undertook um, developing these standards, we had a public consultation that ran from May to August 2018. We worked in uh, collaboration with an independent consultant agency called Pi Tate. Uh, we undertook a survey of, uh, which um, a lot of registrants responded to, but we also had focus groups and interviews with stakeholders as well. Um, and we asked questions about clarity and accessibility of the standards and whether they could be applied in the business context and what the impact of those standards might be. So feedback was broadly positive. 89% um, of survey respondents thought that the draft standards were clear and accessible and 80% thought that the language used was easy to understand, which is what we hoped for. Um, of the improvements that we were told about, um, we uh, were asked to make the language more specific and to help readers to identify um, wh where a business might have responsibility for those standards as opposed to individual registrants working within that business. Uh, we were also asked to make um, more explicit reference to technology and online businesses because that would be beneficial uh, given the current context of business. Um, and we were also asked to look at um, commercial pressures and how um, these could be addressed in practice. So we considered all of the feedback that we received. Uh, we made quite a lot of changes to the text of the standards, uh, which I hope um, those who responded to the survey uh, and to the consultation will have seen. Uh, we definitely made uh, more reference to things like commercial pressures. We uh, explicitly uh, referenced uh, online businesses within the text of the standards. And we talked about um, standards relating to the business environment and the use of news technology and software. Um, where we haven't um, always amended the standards as a result of that consultation feedback, we've looked at other things that we might need to do in terms of implementation. We've recently launched um, a microsite, which is available through the, the um, Optical Council's website. Uh, we're looking at other things that we might do, including th this webinar to help people to understand what the standards are and how they might be implemented. So the standards themselves, uh, 12 high level standards uh, for optical businesses that are registered with the GOC. Uh, we split them into three sections, which is intended to make them easier to understand and more accessible. So you can see why those um, standards are relevant and who they're relevant to. Um, the three sections are standards related to your patients and how to deliver um, a high level of care for them. Uh, around uh, your culture and governance to, ins uh, to assure that your business is operating in the way that we would expect and standards related to your staff uh, and how um, you can support them in delivering high quality care for patients. The standards themselves have supporting statements underneath them and you can see uh, an example on the screen of the high level standard at the top and the statements underneath which are intended to help you to understand what that standard is about and how to meet the standard. So if we talk about some of the things that the standards include, uh, the first set of standards, as I said, relate to um, patient, your patients and the care that you deliver to them. Um, they cover things um, that, that you were in previous, uh, in the previous code, so things like communication, um, but they go further in certain areas. So in this particular set of um, standards, we talk about promoting patient safety, how to raise concerns when you feel that patient safety is compromised, um, and as well as the communication element, how to gain valid consent, which we um, uh, emphasize in our standards for optometrists and DOs. We feel it's important to stress that again in standards for optical businesses. And it covers um, the environment in which care is delivered to make sure that's of high quality as well. Then the second section relates to culture and governance, uh, and this really focuses on the standards um, for your business, how it runs and the systems that need to be in place, uh, particularly those related to clinical governance, but also ensuring that um, the care that you deliver and the, the records that you keep are handled in a confidential way. Um, and obviously this duty of candor, which is uh, was new to healthcare professionals in 2016, uh, which we feel it's um, important to state in terms of um, uh, how businesses operate, to um, identify where things have gone wrong, 
um, to offer apologies and take action when uh, uh, to put those things right. And then finally, the third section is related to um, your staff, ensuring that they have the scope to exercise their own professional judgment and are adequately trained and supervised and collaborating with other healthcare professionals to deliver high quality care. So the standards are aimed at a number of different audiences, um, obviously the business registrants, um, whether directors are lay or um, a registrant themselves, um, but they're also intended to complement the standards for optometrists and dispensing opticians as well, um, and they need to be accessible by patients. They apply to a range of different businesses, so as well as your normal uh, high street practice, they also apply to online businesses. And, and then finally, finally just, just to, to confirm, confirm that, that we published the standards on the 8th of April um, and they came into effect on the 1st of October this year. year. So in essence, essence they're effective at, um, as we speak. So some, so some uh, uh, registrants as part of the consultation indicated that they would like extra support in some areas of practice and we're considering what we can do about that, including um, any supporting guidance that we may need to produce. But we're hoping to cover some of those areas in the webinar, webinar discussion today. today. So, so I'll hand back to Alistair now to kick off with that. Great, thank you Marcus. So an overview there of the background to the standards and the areas that they cover. Now to the, the first question for our panel. Um, this focuses on the, the first section of the business standards uh, which covers your patients um, and in particular we're going to look at standard 1.2 which uh, is concerned with the need for patient care to be delivered in a suitable environment. So the first question, um, which I'm going to ask Josie to kick off with. Um, so we know the optical sector is evolving. Um, the population of the UK is aging. Different demands are being placed on optical businesses. So against that backdrop, how can businesses ensure that a suitable environment is maintained for the delivery of patient care? So Josie. Thank you. Thank you, Alistair. Um, so it's a really pertinent question because, as, as you stated, there's, there's an awful lot of change right now in, 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 in the optical industry. Um, I think the, the, the key thing is, is for businesses, um, and that's, that's the business owner, the director, and, and all of the various team members within a business, to be acutely aware of what changes are happening um, and, and how those changes impact your business. So is, is your practice taken on um, more secondary care services in, in, into a primary care environment? Um, um, and if you are doing that, so perhaps maybe you've taken on board a cataract or a glaucoma scheme, are we absolutely aware of what specific accreditations need to happen? No doubt the optometrists involved probably are, um, but, but does your front of house, house staff know um, that you might have people come in asking different questions? You might have um, patients for, um, who traditionally may have gone to a hospital and, and asked questions about um, concerns about an operation that they've had for cataracts, uh, but actually potentially those people might be coming now to, to your practices. So, so again, I think it's, a, it's, a, it's quite a mind shift for, for, for store staff and, um, and, and, and for practice teams to, to get behind. Um, and then of course with that, there's a whole lot of um, referral pathways, um, all kinds of service level agreements, lots of things are changing. So, so quite complex changes from a contractual point of view, which I, whilst I think it's tempting for the professionals to be um, the, the, the master of, of, of that, in, 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 in fact, actually, your entire store teams need, need to know um, how, how to manage those scenarios. So great big changes there in the environment in which we're practicing. Lots of information for everybody to digest. And we've got to be acutely aware of the needs of patients as they arrive in the practices. Um, and then within that, um, I think in today's world, we're seeing OCTs, we're seeing uh, different types of glaucoma management things come into life all over the country. So lots of, there's lots and lots of things for, for, for everybody to, to know about. But of course, it's not just actually inside the practices. Um, we, I think Mark has made, made reference to a rapidly changing environment. We have aging demographics. We have, um, I think the expression is more people living for longer. Um, uh, I've read a recent statistic that suggested that by, um, I think it's uh, 2043, there'll be twice as many people over the age of 85. Um, and of course, along with that, we're going to see a greater demand for eye care and all types of health, but, 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 but definitely eye care. Um, we are going to see more people in work for longer. 
perhaps with, with more eye problems um, at work. So that's a significant issue. So again, we're going to be seeing those people attending practices. But as a second side to that as well, if, if, if people are, if there's more of us living for longer and, and more of us um, have the opportunity um, to, to, to develop eye, eye problems, uh, inevitably some of them are going to be unable to, to attend practice. Um, they might have comorbidities uh, and they, they, may, they may need to rely on a growing domiciliary sector as well. So as well as having due regard to a great deal of the challenges of introducing those, those services into, into your um, practice, um, we, we've also got to really realistically look at domiciliary services and how we provide that in the environment um, as well. Um, and there's all kinds of safety aspects there. You've got to consider um, how safe are the people um, delivering that service. Uh, how, how well services the equipment, how suitable is the equipment for, for, for that particular provision of service. Um, it, it's, 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 it's a growing concern, I think, that, that perhaps maybe five or ten years ago we didn't need to think too much about these things, but with the increase of services, secondary care into primary care, the, complex of the, the, the complexity of the contracts and the sheer variety of work we'll be doing in, in various different settings, um, all of these business standards are, are, are very, very relevant. So, yeah. Great. Thank you, Josie. So the need to be really aware of the changes that are happening, Absolutely. be able to respond to those, um, enable your business to adapt. And you made a really important point about the need for all staff within the practice to understand the implications too. Mm -hmm. And I think the point too about the growing importance of domiciliary care with that aging population. Yeah. Um, so thank you for that. Um, we're going to turn to Helen now for your um, response on to this particular question. Thank you, Alistair. Um, I think we've got to consider also that um, in this increasingly digital age that a lot more um, information about the patients is stored on computers or indeed in the cloud and we've got to look at make, making sure our backup and um, is, is good and it's stored safely. Um, ensuring a safe environment also means keeping that information safe and secure. Um, only a minimum number of people should be able to access any of the information on the um, on the record card and only that that's appropriate for them to do their job um, in making sure that emails are sent to the right people and use trying using a secure email con uh, connection is um, appropriate certainly in my practice we uh, send relevant patient data to consultants but we only used NHS uh, email uh, connection and when we're sharing information with GPs and other healthcare professionals, we either do that by a secure email or um, letters that are marked confidential. We run a glaucoma scheme for our local hospital where we have access to um, hospital records on one of the computers in the practice. Um, that um, computer, um, you can access any of the records of the patients on there. So. We're making sure that the people accessing that data only access the ophthalmology records and also that only appropriate people can access that, the, those records mm -hmm. by using uh, secure passwords, which are changed regularly. Mm -hmm. um, making sure those computers are not left on uh, when we're not using them and we update the passwords regularly. So, uh, and there's also little things in the practice that we use, uh, we do, uh, we still use the paper GOS forms and, and they have patient data on them and they are in the reception area and we make sure that they're always face down in the, on the reception desk so that patient, other patients can't, aren't able to see the, the records. Thank you, Alan. So I think you've, you've brought out some really important points there about the, the safe storage of data, but then also securely transmitting that data to other parts of the healthcare system. And then the training of staff too. So that um, I'm guessing means all the staff within the practice, you know, as Josie was saying earlier, it's really important you think about the whole practice. Yes, absolutely. Receptionists, <laughs> as well as the um, optical assistants and the the qualified professionals that you employ? Certainly a lot of information is um, discussed verbally, either by phone. In the, glauc the glaucoma scheme that we run, um, we ring up patients and the first thing we say is, you have got a letter to do with glaucoma. So we make sure that that isn't done in front of other patients. Uh, any information that um, is discussed that we feel is confidential is not discussed with any patients that are sat in the waiting room. Um, the front of house staff are trained not to repeat confidential information back 
to, to patients. Um, even people ringing up about their prescriptions over the phone. So all, all that is done uh, by issuing the prescription um, by post. So a lot of thought goes into yeah, making sure yeah. that you're able to deliver these enhanced services, but also, you know, protect patient data. Um, and that's a, you know, an important uh, responsibility for all staff. Really. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Everybody is aware yeah. of this and we regularly remind them in staff training. Also, um, the, it's important to keep all the equipment que clean in the practice as well. So certainly um, somebody comes in with a viral conjunctivitis, the, the staff um, are very well trained in swabbing down everything that the patient has touched. Mm -hmm. but, but we also make sure that it's a clean environment, you know, all the time. So that uh, um, certainly the tonometer heads, we use disposable uh, or everything is cleaned if we're going to mm -hmm. use it on, on a patient. Um, oh after it's been used on another patient and then when I um, <coughs> recently refitted my practice made sure that I have uh, all hard floors in the practice so that they're they were able to be cleaned down because we're doing a lot more hospital level um, services in the practice so they have to be at a hospital level of cleanliness. Great okay so some really practical tips there um, so thank you Helen. I'm going to turn to Marcus now for your take on this question. Yeah, I, yeah, I think, I think um, both Josie um, and um, Helen have given some great tips for businesses that have physical um, premises. I think sort of my focus would be on um, the rising uh, incident of online businesses, or online services being uh, delivered in uh, standard businesses. So I think um, it's important to acknowledge the fact that those businesses need to make uh, or need to meet the same standards um, as any business. Um, and just the fact that the way that they go about that might be a little different to their high street counterparts. Um, particularly in relation to data security that we've talked about, um, it's paramount for online businesses in particular, I think, because of um, the um, ease of access of uh, data breaches or sort of um, people hacking data. Um, I think it's important for businesses to keep their servers and software regularly up to date uh, to make sure that patients' data is as secure as possible. Um, and also sort of if you're offering an online service, you need to, to make sure that that service is accessible as possible to patients, um, particularly um, the information that you're providing. So maybe looking at making your websites more accessible. Um, I know particularly the government uh, website, gov.uk offers advice for what's required in the public sector. It's not mandatory for private organizations or businesses, but certainly um, it doesn't stop people from looking at that advice and taking it into account. Um, and just in, in terms of some of the work that we're doing at GOC, um, we're, because uh, this isn't just a, a, an issue for um, uh, the optical sector, obviously there, there are concerns in other healthcare arenas. Uh, we're working with um, some of our healthcare regulator counterparts, the GMC, the GPHC, um, GDC, to look at um, whether further guidance is needed, needed in terms of remote prescribing. Okay, thank you, Marcus. So, um, I mean, interesting as well to, to think about other types of businesses and how they might need to adapt um, as the future unfolds. Um, I mean, overall, you know, we've, we've hopefully given a sense of the wide range of changes that optical businesses are having to respond to. Um, the business standards, I think, are designed to set out, you know, what good practice looks like, the areas that businesses need to think about, and hopefully our panellists have of giving you some food for thought, some ideas about how to actually implement those standards. Um, and really reinforce the need to think about the whole system, all the staff who work within it. Um, so we'll move on now to the second question, uh, which focuses on the second part of our standards, uh, which cover your culture and governance. So in particular, we will look at standard 2.3, which requires you to have a system of clinical governance in place. Um, so this question is, what does good clinical governance mean to you and what tips can you offer to help others put it into practice? And Marcus, you go first this time. Okay, thank you. So um, I suppose clinical governance to me is about having a systematic approach to maintaining and improving the quality of patient care that you're delivering um, as a business. Uh, so having some sort of system in place to control the quality of care um, and to be able to identify themes and trends to improve care going forward. 
um, and particularly to identify where things might have gone wrong so that you can then deal with them sort of effectively and in an honest way to prevent it from happening again. Um, I think it, it's uh, it's quite easy to put into practice and I think probably lots of businesses are doing sort of aspects of this already. Um, there are activities such as quality assurance of the care that you're delivering, uh, clinical audit of uh, your patient records, um, risk management. Um, I think when we were consulting on the standards for optical businesses that there was some concern about um, how to undertake um, some of these activities so we will acknowledge that um, particularly the audit of records and processes um, which I think is key to um, clinical governance um, and I think it was um, a about how to apply these sorts of systems to different size practices. So if you're not a, a big high street player with lots of resources to put in um, to, to utilize in relation to this, how do, do you go about that? But I think you need to tailor your um, measures to, to the size of your business. And I think it's, um, it's uh, it be relatively straightforward to implement it at whatever size business that you have. Um, if, if you do have a smaller business, um, you probably want to think about the, the way you go about it in terms of um, the formality of that and um, the frequency of, uh, of which you do things like clinical audit might may depend on the size of your business. So larger businesses may have a more formal process in place. Um, smaller businesses could sort of put more informal play, uh, process in place and do it less frequently if they, they don't have as many patients or as many clinical records to audit. Um, I think it's just about auditing a sample of patient records at a frequency that's right for you. I think the, the other aspect uh, for me is about sort of how you use um, the findings of those audits. So obviously we have, um, uh, you'll be able to identify trends and um, uh, areas that have gone wrong in your practice from audit, but then what do you do um, to resolve that or go about correcting? And I think the use of our CET system is probably a, a good way to address any uh, particular learning or development needs with the registrants that you employ. Um, particularly peer review is a, a, an aspect of our CET system that, that's very popular. Um, and sharing learning through peer review is probably a good way of sort of uh, disseminating that information uh, within your business or your organization. Great. Okay. So... Thank you, Marcus. So I think you've, you've really emphasized uh, the need for systematic approach to clinical governance with particular um, focus on uh, auditing of clinical records. But I think really importantly, um, talking about the need for um, a proportionate approach and the standards are designed to be flexible enough to cater for different types of businesses. And you also gave a plug for our CET system and how that can play a part in uh, encouraging reflective practice. Um, so uh, over to you, Helen. Now. Okay, it's uh, it's important. It's it's important um, to learn from things that go wrong and and um, or almost wrong, and take steps to prevent them reoccurring. Uh, those, those steps don't have to be scary or formal or involve any blame within the practice, and, and so it's important really to create a culture within your practice where that errors um, are reported as soon as they become evident and then once uh, safeguards are put in place to prevent recurrent, recurrence, share the issue and action with everybody in the team so that they can all learn from it. Um, where the error involves a patient, uh, we contact the patient with an apology and make sure that we work through a suitable resolution together to make sure that those uh, are resolved. I can think of uh, a couple of examples recently. Um, we had a, a, another practice in the town ring us up for uh, asking if a prescription. And when we opened the record cards on our electronic system, it, it became um, clear that uh, the last pair of glasses we ordered were 12 months previous to that. Um, immediately we contacted the patient offering to rectify that. And then we looked at the, how the system, how it happened within our system we created a pathway and a sort of procedure with our dispensing team to make sure that the error didn't occur and we also looked at um, other orders that um, we'd, we'd created over a period of time to make sure that there was no similar errors and then uh, we've also had a clinical um, issue uh, recently uh, we had a, a 
high minus patient come in and got referred in for cataract surgery. Um, they then come back to us for post cataract treatment and we fill out an audit form from the hospital and the optometrist and uh, we admit that none of us had noticed two tiny boxes on the form, which one which said um, zero and the other said ex expected refraction and they tick the zero box um, and the patient had um, actually ended up with a minus three result. Uh, we worked with the hospital to ensure that the patient got the final result that they wanted and uh, and then we made sure that all the optometrists in the practice were aware of this box and if it didn't, um, the result didn't uh, tie in with the, what had been ticked, then we made it clear to the ophthalmologist um, that that, that, was, um, that was the outcome. Um, so there's a link between candor and clinical governance and, and the previous example shows that the importance of owning the mistakes for the business as well as the individuals. The individuals can't be candid without a culture that supports candor and, and no, no real blame within the, the practice. Um, so various duties are incumbent on the individual to be candid when things go wrong, so the statutory professional and under the standards of practice contractual. Key role of the business is to ensure that those individuals can fulfill all those obligations so that the patient is protected. Um, business registrants must adhere to professional duty of candour, professional responsibility to be open and transparent when things go wrong. Uh, but some businesses may be um, uh, subject to a different uh, a statutory duty of candour, so if they're in England or Scotland. But but really, it's important to just apologise uh, to the patient. I think they really appreciate it when they uh, when you admit that you're wrong and, and and offer to put it right. Yes, absolutely. So candour with patients um, when things do go wrong, but also candour within the practice so that you learn from mistakes, think about how you might adapt your processes, um, and a really crucial point avoiding blame um, yes, so absolutely. yeah thank you helen um josie um alice and, and, and helen and marcus have made some really really valid points um uh, i think helen's brought, brought the importance of candor to life in, in this particular um standard and, and marcus you've mentioned risk management and, and clinical audit which is really, really important. And, and, and in fact, you know, uh, clinical audits is, is one of the greatest things that I can do in my, in my practices, um, particularly in a world where we're actually dealing with, uh, with multiple different types of records. We have multiple different types of digital records these days with all the various different enhanced schemes and, and, and the more complex services that we provide. Um, but I think, I think what I'd just like to, to focus on actually is, is that there's a lot of positive that can come out of this as well. We've talked about risk management and clinical audits and the importance of candour and all of those things are really, really important. Um, and, but I think when, when we've undertaken clinical governance, thankfully most of the time it's not because we've had a major problem to manage or, 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 or control. Um, mainly it's just a good practice and, and it becomes a really great opportunity in our practices um, to discuss about things that have gone well and actually how to share those those various different things and and you can do you know but you you can share great practice in many different ways and in fact let's 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 be honest this webinar is a way of of sharing great great practice but there's lots of different ways of of, of managing that i think if i look at how we actually look at um uh, clinical record keeping audits in in practice um yes we, we look at it and I, I suppose occasionally we do come across problems that we have to manage um but actually most of the time it's actually sharing a way of recording something that gosh i've never thought of doing that before um the number of times i think if i was to look at my record keeping now compared to to, to maybe five years ago the, the, the way i record things now has been strongly influenced by by actually the, the clinical audits that we've had done because I've often thought I'm going to copy that. That's a great, that's a great extra thing to have in my records. What a fantastic way of recording. Um, but but there's other things that come out of of of, of um, clinical governance. So I mean, recently we've we've gone through as have a lot of people in in in, in the UK. Uh, we've installed OCT instruments in in all of our practices. I, I have multiple sites. Um, so I've been bringing the optometrists together from multiple sites to talk about OCT and just very simple things like how to use the equipment efficiently and making sure you're looking at the right scans. Um, if, if, if you're working within a team, it's amazing how quickly you can find out something very beneficial to you in practice. 
I think um, from a management point of view, um, again, if I take my own example of working across multiple locations. Um, we have monthly meetings with, 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 with our practice managers. We identify all the good things and all the bad things, um, but we share some great practice ideas, as well as preventing problems from happening again, as, as, as Helen said. Um, I, I love to take the opportunity, actually, to celebrate things like, you know, what went really well with the charity uh, event that we had and what would we do differently in the future. Um, we've been having, I mean, this year there's been quite a lot of focus in, in, in the national press on mental health at work. And I know we focused on that in our, in our management group, which may have just been a small thing, but actually by bringing it into a clinical governance environment, we were able to actually really investigate the importance of mental health at work and, and start to identify places where you can get information from um, support lines and, and the alike. So, so I, th I think there's an awful lot of really good positive things that come out of clinical governance, as well as obviously having to do the risk management, which is important. So, Right, thank you, Josie. So, so really clinical governance is about sharing things that have uh, gone well, things that have gone less well, uh, but doing so in a really open way within the practice. Um, with a view to actually continuously improving really um, adapting to changes in practice including the use of technology and you know instilling that that kind of culture whereby staff embrace um, that reflection and that um, that willingness to adapt and improve absolutely so, um, yeah thank you everyone we will move on now to the, the third and final question um, in the panel discussion at least um, this looks at how the standards relate to your staff within the business and we're talking here about any staff whose roles could have an impact on patient care. So optometrists, dispensing opticians, other healthcare professionals, optical assistants, but then also other staff within the practice, including uh, working in the reception. So we're going to look in particular at standard 3.2, uh, which requires staff to be suitably trained, qualified and registered. And the question relates to the fact that you know, staff obviously come into the practice at different levels, different skill sets and experiences. Um, so what are the challenges in making sure that staff are all suitably trained? And then how can these challenges be overcome? So we're going to, um, first of all, turn to Marcus. Or Helen, would you like to I'll, take yes. that up first? Um, so a lot of the uh, systems in our practice have evolved over time and, and what works best for us. We currently have a very part-time um, staff. Uh, all the optoms do one or two days each and all the front of house staff also do one or two days each. So communication between everybody is really important. Um, we each have an entry in the workshop with, where any um, documents that need to be or things that need to be dealt with are placed and any uh, documents that are passed around are initialed by each person and then passed on to the next person. We obviously train the front of the house, a front of house staff when they initially start and, and they have ongoing training as well when we identify areas that they don't understand. Uh, we have how-to guides on our practice database, so if you're really stuck on something and you haven't done it for a while, you're able to access those. Every morning we meet for 20 minutes and we try to um, look at what issues are going to come up in the day and try and manage those in advance instead of panicking when they um, happen. Uh, we have regular staff meetings. Um, some of them are small staff meetings, some of them are whole team staff meetings. We try to get the whole team, which is quite difficult to do. Um, a few times a year and then we work through any issues that um, have ar arisen in the meantime and um, we, we work through them and, and develop a solution. We have informal peer review between the optometrists and the practice where we share difficult cases. Um, we're quite open if we don't know how to solve something and, um, so, and then if somebody suggests something or if we don't know the answer then when further research is needed we look into the evidence and, and then share the findings amongst all of us so it's really important to create this open culture um, and and nobody's afraid to learn and nobody uh, does know everything um, so um, we, we all learn from positive and negative things that happen in the practice 
Um, I often do in-house training for staff on areas of knowledge that they don't understand and they've asked me about and, and we do it on quite an informal basis during the day in a quiet period sometimes. Great, okay, so thanks Helen. Um, you've emphasised there the need to think about training for all staff within the practice, how-to guides, regular staff meetings, trying to anticipate issues that might crop up and then also peer review to collectively solve difficult cases that crop up. So I think some really good um, tips there. I'm going to turn to Marcus now, I think. So over to you, Marcus. Um, I, I don't think I'll talk about the challenges, uh, not working in a business myself, but, but maybe some of the solutions that businesses could put in place. Um, I think sort of initially having um, some solid systems in place to identify um, individual staff training and support needs um, is a must and, and how businesses monitor performance, um, however that might be. Um, but I think sort of picking up on something that Helen says, those sorts of um, systems don't necessarily need to be formal. I think maybe it would be a good idea in sort of larger businesses where there's, there's quite a lot of staff, it helps to be organised, but you could do that on an informal basis if you've got a smaller business um, there. I think um, it, induction of staff into businesses is important and having a sort of a, a proper process in, in place for that so you can um, understand uh, where a person is at the point that they enter your business and what sort of training, experience, knowledge that they already have um, and what they might need going forward. And it's an opportunity to explore um, uh, their learning needs at that particular point. I think also sort of linked to induction, if um, somebody's coming in new to your business, having sort of some sort of buddying um, system with other staff members um, might be helpful, um, particularly to share um, their experience and to help that person settle into your business. Because um, all, all businesses are going to be different. They're all going to have their own protocols. Um, um, it's not that they're all uniform. Um, and I've mentioned before appraisals and performance reviews to, to monitor performance might, might be useful um, and certainly a way of identifying uh, training needs for staff. Um, I suppose having clear job descriptions um, so that people understand what role that they're undertaking is uh, also useful. Um, just linking back to what we've talked about previously, we've talked about the sort of things like clinical audit and identifying sort of, um, learning that's useful for the whole profession. So sort of, uh, again, I'm going to plug CET again, um, peer review and sharing that learning with your individual staff is a sort of a really good way of um, getting that learning out there and sort of addressing some of those learning needs um, that your staff might have. Great, thank you, Marcus. So anyone would think you're responsible for our CET system <laughs> here at the awesome. GOC. Um, so in addition for a plug for, for that uh, system, you, you talked about inducting staff, which is a really good way of identifying their individual learning needs. Uh, another idea um, is the idea of having a buddy system within a practice. Um, but I think you brought out the fact that, you know, not every practice is the same. You know, there will be different processes, procedures to follow. So just making sure that you find ways of enabling new staff to get to grips with um, how each individual um, business works. So thank you for that. I'm going to turn now to Josie. Hi, um, I, I think this is a really interesting discussion and we've talked about buddy systems and new members of the team. I, th I think one of the areas that perhaps we haven't touched on is, is how in the changing environment um, that, that we've discussed, the technology, the various different schemes coming on board, um, how, do, how do we bring locums on board? I, I think that's a really, really big challenge for lots of practices. Um, you know, we, we, we're in a world now where I think that the days when you could arrive in a practice with, with not really knowing much about that practice in advance uh, and just test eyes, I, I, think, I think those days are, 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 are very rapidly uh, running out. Um, if we look at all the many new services, the absolute plethora of digital referral platforms across the, uh, across the, the, the four nations, um, and in fact, only, only this week, I'm just in the middle myself of introducing a new referral platform, which is, is not the first time I've done that. Um, so if anybody had come to work for me two, three years ago, they'll now be coming into a different environment um, over the next couple of weeks. So there's a really big challenge for how do, how do we bring locums up to speed in your practice? And I think within these standards, I, I, I think it means that 
both the locum but also the business does need to think in advance of, of that engagement what level of equipment did it need to be familiar with um, again over the last 12 months we've seen a tremendous um, uptake of OCT in practice um, and that's a very rapid change I think I think literally I don't know what the figures absolutely are but there's a rapid um, rollout of, of OCT across the United Kingdom um, but if you're a locum is, is, is it it's a question to ask yourself I mean is it acceptable to set up in a practice and not really know how to interpret um, an OCT result or, or not to be familiar with a type of OCT that might be in your practice um, but equally you know does the business have responsibility to make that locum aware of the equipment that they'll be using when they arrive and that should all be done in advance um, is it appropriate to maybe allow the locum to come in a little bit ahead and, and get familiar with the equipment um, is it maybe just a case of bringing into life a, a booklet perhaps which has all the information ahead and maybe that it's a digital booklet maybe it's a digital file that you keep up to date um, but, I, but I do think you know it's it, it's becoming a complex um, offer that we have in our practices um, and if we are using um, locum uh, optometrists or locum dispensing opticians in some cases and locum contact lens opticians um, I, it's it's actually much more important now more than ever to, to consider what they'll be doing when they arrive and what our expectation is of them uh, and, and perhaps what their expectation is of the practice uh, so as not to fall into any in, 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 into any problems offering a professional um, clinical service thank you Josie so so you've really brought out I think a, a really important issue um, which lots of businesses are um, dealing with which is how to make sure that you work with locums in an effective way um, and I think some good ideas across the board there in answer to that question you know a real focus on training for all staff within a practice finding ways of bringing people together to share ideas the value of peer review um, induction as a way of um, identifying learning needs and I think your point about thinking in advance before a, a locum arrives at the store um, particularly important for locums but applies I think to all staff who might be joining the practice so hopefully you know that was um, a very helpful discussion uh, for everyone um, lots of I think thought-provoking uh, ideas um, we're going to move on now to the questions that we've received in advance um, of this webinar um, so to start off with um, we've grouped together some questions that um, really relate to um, GOC's role so I'm going to turn to Marcus to have a go answering these first one is um, you know, what types of complaints does the GOC receive about uh, business registrants so um, give us a flavor of uh, those complaints Marcus please. always of interest to our registrants I think um, so we receive quite a variety of uh, complaints um, but uh, the most common that we've received in the last three years in relation to business registrants relate to, to three categories so the first one is not having correct procedures in place or not applying their established procedures appropriately uh, the second one is poor complaint handling um, and the third is directors of optical businesses failing to declare cautions or convictions Okay, thank you, Marcus. Um, and I should say as well that I think we're we're very conscious that um, you know, particularly as people um, go about implementing these new standards, there's a lot of interest in you know, the kind of cases that we deal with. So I think we are going to be looking at how we can share information about cases on a much more regular basis, and that you know will hopefully uh, prompt some some learning and some reflection among businesses more generally. So second question then um, do the new business standards mean that I now have to take all the responsibility for everything that goes wrong in my business and presumably that comes from a, you know, a business owner so Marcus um, absolutely not that that's not the intention of the business standards it's, it's not to take away um, uh, responsibility from uh, optometrists or dispensing opticians that, that you employ um, so the standards themselves have been drafted to be complementary to the standards of practice for optoms and DOs um, but we will still have the, the same expectations that optometrists and DOs will be responsible for the work that they do. Um, where um, the standards are more relevant to, to businesses is uh, where they uh, relate to responsibility for ensuring patient safety in those um, areas that are outside of the control of the individual. 
Um, so sort of where um, uh, systems are put in place, which um, the, the individual optometrist might not have as much control over. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, there is always going to be some overlap between the responsibilities of uh, the individual and the business. And in some cases, um, it might be both um, sets of registrants that are responsible for some areas. Okay. So in short, no, but then hopefully some food for thought there about you know the, the kind of issues that uh, that it's important to think about. Um, third question on this this first slide here is: um, Do all optical businesses have to register with the GOC and for the new standards? Always the controversial question. So the the answer is um, no at the moment. So um, the only. Uh, organizations that have to register with us by law um, are corporate bodies um, that are acting as optical businesses uh, which are using titles such as optometrist or optician in their title um, so they have to register what i would say though is that sort of uh, i would say that patients expect um, uh, sort of our optical businesses to be registered in the recent survey that we did uh, we did ourselves 84 percent of um, patients interviewed said that they'd rather attend a, a business that's registered with us but of course it's not quite as easy as that because not everybody is able to register with us uh, so some other businesses may register if they uh, meet certain criteria um, they have to be a body corporate to start with and they have to have a certain number of directors um, uh, on their boards or be um, offering certain services but there are certain businesses that can't register even if they want to so these are mainly people that are um, body corporates um, so businesses such as sole traders or, or partnerships um, so we always do as much as we can to encourage businesses to register but our own legislation is is um, currently prohibiting uh, some of that but if you'd like to register and you're not registered already and you'd like some more information about um, whether you can, um, I'd recommend contacting our registration team. Um, you can either phone them or they're available at registrationoptical.org, which is the email address. Okay, thank you, Marcus. So, so the, the business standards, you know, they reflect good practice and we would encourage all optical businesses to comply with them. Um, and although it's it's true that at the moment not everyone has to register, we are committed to working with government to create that level playing field and change the law so that um, all businesses will have to register in the future. So I think even if you're not registered now, good to be working towards um, and actually thinking actively about how to apply the standards. Okay, so we will move on then to the next question, uh, which is for you, Helen. So I'm a small independent business owner you might be able to identify with this, uh, <laughs> this questioner um, and I'm worried about the cost of implementing the standards. Can I do so in a way that's low cost but still properly protects patient safety and a particular worry about the cost of making information accessible to patients? Um, I'm a firm believer of not reinventing the wheel and if it's already out there I um, steal other bits of information from other uh, er areas. Um, there, there are lots of informa free information brochures out there for patient safety that are written by our professional bodies, um, by our def defence bodies, and, and really there's no reason that you should have to produce your own ones unless you want to personalise them. Um, providing written information as well as verbal might be sufficient for some, but um, that they really need something to read when they go home to, to actually digest what you just told them so it's really useful to give them these leaflets and and you could use the the college leaflets that uh, if you're a college member or as i say that there are other uh, resources out there um, on the internet as well easily downloadable and printable in your own practice okay so that's a really good tip then it doesn't have to be costly to provide no, good not. patient information no. draw on the resources that are out there provided by the professional bodies um, across the sector yes so, um, and, and on the internet there's lots of resources by hospital um, ophthalmology departments as well that are really useful yeah excellent thank you so we'll move on now to the next question i'm going to turn to josie for this one so I own a branch practice of a multiple. Are the expectations of me much higher given the size of the overall business? Well, that's, a, that's a great question and I, and I think I'm pleased to say the answer is no. I, I don't think you're going to be held to a, a higher standard. Um, I, I guess where you are is, is 
or challenge the, 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 if you're running a bigger business you'll have you've got more people to to manage you, you might have to repeat um, some of the things that we've said to, multiple times but but are the standards any different absolutely not the standards are absolutely the same um but i think you know the measures that that, that you'll need to take to ensure compliance uh, just need to be appropriate and, and proportionate um and, and i think the most important thing is and, and this probably applies to all businesses but 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 again if you're dealing with multiple people and, and multiple maybe multiple practices in, in in that scenario you've got to be able to justify whatever decision that you've taken even if they're called into question and, and i i suppose the one thing i've learned over the years is it's actually okay to make a mistake um you know it's, it, it, it's it, your your expectations are, are, are much the same as all the other businesses and if you make a mistake that's fine as long as somebody can understand how that happened and and, and if it was if, if it was well-meaning so so no I, I think the short answer Alistair is 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 um is the expectations are just the same despite the uh, the, the difference in size of all businesses absolutely yeah I think that's the key to it it's just a, a adaption and and, and have, you know you, you might have to think differently you, you, you might have multiple sites uh, you might be running multiple types of clinics so yes there, there may be more for you to do um, but but your application of the standards will be no higher um, than than anybody else running the same standards in in their own practice in, in smaller practices. Great. Okay. So hopefully a, a reassuring message then for yeah. for that particular question and yeah. anyone else who's in that position. No no, no unfair treatment. <laughs> okay. Good. Um, so we'll move on to the next question, um, which I'm going to turn to Marcus to answer. The new business standards talk about supporting staff to override confidentiality where it is in the public interest to do so um, is there more information available setting out when confidential information might need to be passed on in that way uh, th th this is definitely a difficult area for our registrants and we've done research previously which is asking whether our optometrists and do's feel comfortable in in or confident in overriding confidentiality concerns and it's always particularly linked to um to the issue of vision and driving so uh, when you potentially might need to report people to the dvla or the dva um i think sort of uh, we've recognized this and this is an area that that we've um we recently consulted on in terms of um some draft guidance for registrants i think the main sort of um, onus um, which is on all healthcare professionals is um, that there will be certain instances where you need to override confidentiality in the public interest and that is always going to be a professional decision that you have to make as an individual and what we'd hope is that businesses will help support um, their staff in doing that um, and what we're hoping to do is um, produce guidance that supports both individuals and the business in, in doing that we're we're currently um, uh, reviewing the outcomes of that consultation uh, we're looking to publish some more guidance in relation to that um, uh, either at the end of this year or the start of next year so something we, we don't have anything specific in place at the moment but we will have imminently okay thank you Marcus so um, more guidance to follow um, to help you all tackle that particular um, particularly challenging issue um, and that actually brings us to the end of today's session so um, thank you everyone who has taken part and um, um, hopefully you've all found it uh, useful uh, thought-provoking uh, informative um, I'd like to thank our panelists so Josie Forte Helen Tilly and Marcus Dye um, we would really welcome um, your feedback on the webinar today it's actually the first webinar the GOC has produced, so very keen to hear how you found it, um, whether you'd like us to do more. Um, hopefully the answer to that is yes. Um, looking at Helen and Josie now, they're thinking maybe we should invite some other council members and share the, uh, the, the pleasure of taking part. Um, any questions that you have um, about the business standards or about standards more generally, um, we've included here the email address that you can use to get in touch. And if you have found the webinar um, useful, um, please you know, tell your colleagues. We'll be uploading it to our standards website shortly. So anyone who hasn't been able to take part this evening um, will be able to um, listen to that um, in their own time. Unfortunately, they won't um, be able to claim the CET point that was on offer this evening, but um, 
hopefully that won't be too much of a disincentive. So thank you again to um, our panel and also to all of you for taking part. Um, hope it was informative and um, I will now say um, goodbye. So thank you again. Bye for now. <laughs>